Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and For Paws International as the main sponsor, platinum sponsor. Our um, Before I go ahead with the next interesting session we have ahead of us, I have an important announcement. You may have in your inbox, especially uh, those of you living in Australia, an important uh, email uh, entitled Important Update for the J, uh, JADMC Delegates. It actually uh, corrects a glitch, uh, corrects a glitch um, of four hours between Australia and those presenters in New York that you may be interested in listening to. So if you go to our website, you will see uh, the differences or the, or the right schedule there. So please check uh, for this title, important update for JADMC delegates. Thank you. Just a couple of uh, <clears throat> housekeeping issues. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled. So any questions and answers, please use the feature at the bottom of your uh, screen called Q&A. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captions. So if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen as well. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADMCConf for Twitter and other social media. A short evaluation will be available when you exit the session. And just as a reminder, the video recording of this presentation will be available later uh, in the year after it's been properly edited. I have the pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Susan Harper, Deputy Director of Office of Animal Care and use at the National Institute of Health, NIH, in the USA. And hopefully, Dr. Joshua B. Fine, DMV, Principal and Senior Scientific Advisor at the Tunnel Government Services in the USA as well. The title of the presentation is The Role of Vulnerability Assessments in Disaster Planning, which is a crucial uh, element for planning. And as you know, plans uh, are important. Planning is essential. Plans are useless, uh, they used to say, but uh, we'll hear more about that from uh, Susan and Harper. The floor is yours, gentlemen and lady. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Is my audio yeah, okay? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay, great. So thank you um, to everybody who's joining us. And also we want to thank the conference planning committee for giving us this opportunity to speak. Um, we're going to be talking about vulnerability assessments and disaster planning with an emphasis on how those apply to um, programs that have agricultural animals. But the principles that we're presenting will apply to any type of animal program. So a quick disclaimer that this presentation was prepared by um, myself and Josh and uh, in our personal capacity. They do not, um, our, they reflect our opinions and do not reflect the views of our employers, which is the US government in my case, and tunnel government services for Josh. Our objectives are we're going to discuss vulnerability, um, understand how vulnerability assessments inform emergency management, recognize some of the unique issues that pertain to animal agriculture, learn about multidisciplinary teams that have, um, and that approach to vulnerability assessments, and discover how to put best practices and strategies into action. So we'll start off first by what is vulnerability? And we have several definitions on this slide and um, how they apply to emergency management. But the common theme is that vulnerability is any part of an asset system or organization that's susceptible to da damage or harm when it's exposed to a hazard or threat. So that's the short definition. Oops. And because hazards are critical to understanding vulnerability, we're going to talk a little bit about hazard assessments, which is usually the first step in the process. Hazard assessments are a systemic process to identify, analyze, and evaluate the various hazards that pose the most significant threats to the target asset or organization. And it's not just, uh, it's not sufficient to just list all the possible hazards. You also need to analyze their impact by estimating 
what's the likelihood that they will actually occur, and also what's the severity of their impact to the target or asset or organization. And these, um, these results can be described uh, quanti qualitatively by using descriptive scales like low, medium, or high, or they can also be expressed quantitatively using numeric values like percent, probability, financial impact, and, and so on. Having a systemic ranking system allows you to prioritize what steps or actions you need to take to manage those risks and keep them within an acceptable level. Some of the things you want to consider are whether certain parameters or conditions can amplify or diffuse the effects of a hazard. And of those factors, what can you actually control or change that will lower a particular hazard's impact? Um, and that leads to the question, how do we change our operations to become more resilient and adaptive to potential hazards? So this is just a quick review. Um, most hazards, in, in general, most hazards can be divided into two major categories. Uh, the first is natural disasters. And we have a map here that shows how they tend to vary by geographic region in the US. Um, natural disasters are things like weather events, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, geologic events like earthquakes, tsunamis, avalanches. Pestilence and disease, which can be anything from an animal, uh, large scale animal disease outbreak or introduction of an exotic pest or uh, pathogen, and brush fires and forest fires. The other big category is. Um, man-made or technological hazards. And these include things like contamination hazards that are caused by a large scale release of chemicals or effluent, uh, confinement or transport hazards, which include uh, things like damaged fence lines that allow animals to escape or structural damage that may be due to fires or collapsing structures and, um, or animals that get injured while, while they're being loaded or unloaded for transportation. Critical services um, are all disruptions in utilities uh, such as electric, gas, uh, water, um, can also be a disruption in your workforce or a sudden loss of funding. Um, there can be major equipment failures, and I'm thinking of ventilation systems as a good example, or security breaches. And the lines are not always as clear as I'm presenting them because um, you, uh, many of the hazards are related or um, you can have a natural hazard that can lead to multiple technological hazards. So now we're going to talk a little bit about vulnerability and how we assess it, uh, that we have a basic understanding of hazards. We want to know how they affect a particular asset or organization. And in order to do that, we need to identify and assign values to the inherent weaknesses of that asset or organization. So these assessments can be performed for individual farms, for entire industries, at the community level, or at the state and national level. And because vulnerabilities reflect individual susceptibilities, they can vary between farms, between different populations of animals at the same farm, and even between individual animals in the same group. Some questions you want to ask are, what components or individuals are the most vulnerable? Are there any variables that influence that vulnerability, such as age or production status or health? And can these variables be manipulated to raise or lower vulnerability? As illustrated on this slide, a threat is the result of a hazard being presented to a vulnerable system. In some cases, hazards are unavoidable, and that's especially true for agricultural um, uh, programs. Proper identification and addressing vulnerabilities goes a long way to reducing the probability and impact of threats, particularly if they can be manipulated at the human or procedural level. A vulnerability assessment is a comprehensive evaluation of an organization's assets to determine where there are gaps or that would allow a hazard to take advantage of the, the target and, and escalate into an actual threat. So the steps that are normally described for vulnerability assessment are listed on here, and they involve an initial assessment, and that's where you identify the organization or system's critical assets and define the value of each in terms of the overall operations of that program, and then potential risks if there's a failure. 
You'll also need to gather information about the actual organization or system that you're um, assessing, such as its physical size, what are the workforce demographics, um, and so on. And that's followed by a vulnerability scan, which is um, identifying the most critical vulnerabilities in that system or organization, and then validating your results by testing or challenging them. The last step is preparing a vulnerability assessment report, and that summarizes the findings of your uh, assessment, describing each vulnerability and its scope, its potential impact, and any recommended mitigations. This slide lists various qualities or characteristics that are indicators of vulnerability. It's very similar to the way we ca characterized hazards. Um, these indicators can be categorized into two major groups. The physical factors, which are things like geographic location, season, weather events uh, for that location, the landscape, associated buildings, roads, bridges, utilities, and other resources. And social factors um, are the other group, and these include characteristics like population demographics, past experience, economic variables, unique business operations, regulations that apply to that location or the populations that are at risk, political factors, resource availability, and workforce behaviors and educational levels. Characterizing the social factors is probably the most challenging um, uh, task because estimating their influence can be complex and highly subjective. Many social factors do not have direct measures to assign when assessing vulnerability. So of the factors that we just looked at, there are some that cannot be easily managed or manipulated to minimize or lower vulnerability. They're outside your control. It's difficult to change a specific geographic location's weather, its topography, its population demographics, its economy, and its regulatory framework. Therefore, you're often forced to limit your attention to those factors that are within your scope of influence to control. And um, these era, the areas where your efforts are most likely to have a significant effect on lowering vulnerability for agricultural animals are highlighted on this slide. And they include the way facilities and structures are designed and constructed, having redundant or alternative systems to avoid infrastructure failures, using past experience to inform your business practices and decisions, modifying your business plans and operations to become more flexible and agile, and minimizing human error through uh, appropriate supervision and training. We'll talk a little bit about property considerations, um, and this should influence the way your facilities and structures are designed and built. Some of the factors that should be considered when you're in reviewing potential vulnerabilities of a property are listed on this slide. Um, any pre-existing structures or um, systems or geographic conditions, all of these are important considerations, particularly if you're planning to renovate or construct a new building, fence, or any other type of structure. And the collective impact of all these factors can be strategically used to determine the best physical location and the size and design and construction materials that you want to use for a particular property. Some of the operational considerations that you want to think about include the types and numbers of vulnerable animals that are present, um, their health and production status, any critical systems or equipment that's needed for their basic care. And these are things like mechanical ventilation, plumbing, electricity, or vehicles. What's their food source? Uh, is shelter required? What specialized services are needed? And these would be things like veterinary care, communication, and uh, of course, cash flow. For personnel considerations, this is an area where there's probably a significant uh, a potential for you to be able to influence vulnerability. Paying attention to your staffing levels to make sure that you have the right number of employees is uh, to perform the work, the amounts and types of work that are, need to be done, and also that these individuals are properly trained, supervised, and have reasonable flexibility to attend to their personal matters is critical for minimizing errors and accidents. 
And hiring the right person at the start is essential. You wanna look at things like their work history, their background, and possible ethical or social concerns uh, to make sure that the individuals you're hiring are a good match for your organization. So to talk a little bit about some of the unique challenges associated with agriculture, so far, most of the things that we've discussed can be applied to animals in a lot of different environments. However, there are some unique concerns associated with agricultural animals that you should include in your vulnerability assessment. Agricultural animals involve a wide range of species and farming operations. Um, some of the sectors, especially the poultry and swine industries in the US, are moving towards vertical integration. And this consolidates some aspects of production and can potentially increase vulnerability. If there's breakdowns in the supply chains, uh, services, or any critical aspects of the production cycle. And we did experience some of that during the pandemic. Another consideration is the large numbers and sizes of many of these species. Um, what, this, what the end result is, is it's not practical or feasible to relocate these animals in order to remove them from a hazard if, if a hazard is present. And um, as you would do with some, uh, some companion animals that are individually owned. And this leaves you with no options other than to shelter in place. Your public authorities may not be adequately equipped or staffed to provide extensive assistance during an emergency, particularly during large scale disasters when their um, attention is redirected to humanitarian assistance that takes a priority over other things. This means that individual farms may be, ha um, may be responsible for fending for themselves until um, assistance is available to support their operations. So operations that are dependent on critical services such as plumbed water or electricity can deteriorate quickly if there's extended disruptions and you don't have an alternate plan. Biosecurity and public health concerns also start to emerge when there's indiscriminate mixing of animals of uncertain health status or improvised collection and storage of waste. And finally, you should expect that individuals involved in response efforts will become fatigued and possibly careless, and this can lead to accidents and injuries. So now I'll let Dr. Fine speak. Can everyone hear me? At least I hope. Um, so to dovetail on what Susan had just spoken about, um, there are a few recent examples of major disasters that have affected U.S. agriculture. Um, because of the many strengths of uh, domestic agriculture in this country, the size, complexity, and level of interconnectedness um, is inherently vulnerable to a range of hazards. Uh, some of these examples span a few areas in the country. There was a very large explosion um, in Texas that involved a dairy facility where an unprecedented number of cattle were killed at one time. Um, there's also regional effects, uh, for example, the flooding in North Carolina, which is in the eastern seaboard and it's also one of the largest concentrations of uh, swine production in the country and lastly uh, what we're suffering with now is just a tremendous heat wave which is affecting um, you know, uh, animals housed outdoors across the country next slide please thank you um, so getting back to the process of uh, vulnerability assessments it's important to understand that uh, the vulnerability assessment team should include personnel with expertise across applicable disciplines to the best of your ability. Um, for example, this may be dictated by the premises or type of assessment that's being done. Say for a large scale pork production facility, you could want representatives from key areas like veterinary services, facility operations, uh, waste management, um, you know, the important areas um, of the operation. It, there are other options uh, to enhance uh, the team. It's possible to include external parties depending on the level of sensitivity and the value there. Um, one could include representatives from an industry group, um, local law enforcement or emergency response um, individuals, uh, potentially someone from the public at large, if, if you are inclined to do so, um, they may have perspective. If there are specific hazards that are recognized as earlier in the process of vulnerability assessment, um, that may also dictate the type of expertise that would be involved. Um, with the right background experience to you know, address that. For example, you know, emergency response specialists who were experienced with flooding if you were in an area where that was you know, highly likely. 
Next slide, please. So this is one of my favorite topics um, in terms of public policy and the law framework as it applies to vulnerability assessments. Um, you know, disaster planning across the federal government changed uh, around 9-11 and subsequently with the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, the, a number of uh, authorities of different agencies were consolidated there, and that department was given the role of uh, ultimately coordinating the emergency response posture for the entire country. Um, so just briefly, um, you know, in the event that a disaster is declared at the national level, the federal government, which is led by Homeland Security and the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, which is now a component of DHS, um, responds at the request of and in support of states, tribes, territories, and um, you know, other areas within the country. These activities are codified under something called the National Response Framework, which is a document that includes various scenarios based on different types of disasters, defines roles and responsibilities, gives some examples, um, and it helps guide that um, for a number of likely scenarios. Um, just to, so everyone understands, the DHS FEMA authority does not supersede um, agency-specific authorities, say for food and agriculture, that's still led by the sector-specific agency, the Department of Agriculture, and similarly for public health, it would be led by Health and Human Services. Um, this is a way that the agencies can coordinate, but um, you know, not sort of leapfrog authorities. Um, lastly, um, it's important to know that um, recovery is focused on restoring, redeveloping, and revitalizing communities impacted by disaster. Um, there's another framework document that helps cover that. It's the National Disaster Recovery Framework um, that identifies six recovery support functions, or RSFs, to provide technical assistance and support the recovery um, you know, in, to meet the needs of the impacted communities. These include areas such as community planning and capacity building, housing, economics, infrastructure systems, health, and so on. Next slide, please. So, yeah, in this area, they're just to help in your own individual planning. There are different resources available to assist people um, engaged in you know, risk, vulnerability type of assessments. And I just did a quick search, um, you know, based on knowledge. And uh, within the United States, there are a number of land grant universities that are sort of regionally affiliated, and a number of them have uh, extension services that engage with uh, the local community, particularly the uh, rural and agricultural community. Um, so, you know, this example is from the state of Maine, where the Extension Service did an analysis that um, is sort of a generic hazard assessment of what's likely or less likely to affect a farm, and then how, um, you know, some mitigating actions that could be taken based on different scenarios. Yeah, and this is, this is publicly available and could be helpful for, you know, anyone. Other examples I found... Um, the National Pork Board is one of the more forward-leaning uh, professional organizations uh, when it comes to animal health in the United States. Um, they have templates for emergency response um, hazard plans. Uh, they have also some training and guidance modules. Uh, so the states themselves have their own emergency plan templates to en encourage local development of capability. Um, and there are other sources. Next slide, please. So lastly, just to round this out, um, the federal government also has um, various uh, emergency response planning guidances that are all over the internet. Um, and then lastly, the peer-reviewed literature also has specific examples that may be helpful. So getting back to best practices, um, yeah, in utilizing the output of uh, vulnerability analyses to develop you know, premises specific emergency response plans, it's necessary to adhere to certain core principles as depicted in the slides. And these are things that are um, applicable across premises and you know, organizations, um, sort of you know, bread and butter things like identifying the core business practices and critical infrastructure, um, assessing industry pressures and external influences of the organization, developing you know, rational contingency plans that are scalable, uh, prioritizing response actions and stabilization efforts, et cetera, um, especially defining lines of authority and other things along that nature that are um, you know, sort of common sense that need to be revisited on a, on a regular basis. Next slide, please. So 
Uh, further on this, there are many ways to prevent or minimize risk once a disaster strikes. Um, many of these examples are facility specifics, but there are some common themes among agricultural risks. Some of these include, um, I, I believe this was spoken to in the previous lecture, um, identifying livestock so they can be effectively you know, assessed and traced by their identity if they were to escape or to be moved to a secondary holding area. Um, also identifying areas for animals to be housed safely under disaster conditions. Admittedly, that uh, you know there are logistical challenges there based on the size of the animal or the production facility, but um, it can be done in certain examples, like you know, moving animals within a, a premises to a higher elevation location if there were to be uh, flooding in one region. So, I mean, then there are also some you know generic ideas um, about how to prevent risk in. Uh, outdoor type of facilities in terms of maintaining fence lines, having lighting suppression systems, or excuse me, lightning suppression systems, um, having emergency generators and backup systems, uh, common sense items like storing all chemicals and flammables um, in a manner so that they're not hazardous unto themselves, and then um, you know keeping the buildings free of uh, brush and vegetation. Next, Sorry to interrupt. We have to. Uh, we need to wrap up, doctor. Okay, no problem at all. Um, yeah, we can. We can just flip through these. And... Yeah, just on the point of evaluating, and you know, we mentioned conducting exercises. It's important to do that. There are some guidance out there um, in the literature and online at the various government websites. Um, it's important to evaluate your policies and procedures on a regular basis. Um, there are things that can be learned from incident reports and um, events. Um, so that you're not repeating the same um, mistakes over and over again. And those things can um, help ensure that your documents are living documents and are revisited on a regular basis. And I think I addressed this. Yeah, and, and that as well. We could just go to the... Um, so th this is um, our concluding slide. Um, we want to thank everybody for their attention. Um, our goal is to provide a high level overview of vulnerability assessments and the associated emergency response planning strategies. And um, some of the key takeaways are mentioned on this slide. Uh, we defined vulnerability, explained how the assessments factor into emergency management, discussed some unique issues related to ag animals, and described how to assemble a multidisciplinary vulnerability assessment team, and um, then went over some best practices. So we'd like to thank everybody for their attention, and I don't know if there's time for questions or if we've exhausted our time. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Harper and Dr. Fine. Uh, this was a really um, detailed presentation of the uh, fundamental or the building bricks of any uh, good uh, vulnerability assessment, especially for farm animals. Um, I was hoping that we had more time uh, uh, for questions. Uh, the uh, questions and answer uh, bit was not um, was not. Uh, used but uh, i bet you there will be a lot of visits to your uh, resources because they are they're very detailed at this point uh, we need to uh, thank our uh, presenters